flames lit by a center one. The energy comes in at the, at the initial B and goes out with that final Z. They fit together to form a big olive, which is like the spin axis. This is the only corner that has spin symmetry. If I tried to rotate it about any other point, it wouldn't have the same full symmetry. This has symmetry. So it's as if there really is a vector going through the middle. There really is a spin axis going through the middle. And that's defined by that giant olive. That is the seventh olive. That's the day of rest. There's, a, there's an A on every one of the vortexes. And then there's a capital A, a big A, down the middle. Well, if I lift off one of the vortexes and look at it, You'll notice something about it. It looks different from every way I hold it. Every way I can hold this vortex, it has a different shadow. Here's a uh, more accurately made one. And I'll tell you where it, what the shape is supposed to represent. Colors are the seven color map. Did the ancients have the seven color map? Did they know the seven color map theorem? Not necessarily, but they wouldn't have had to. It's the same order of coloring as you see in a rainbow. A rainbow is nothing but the sun is up here and you're standing here, an arc in the sky with red to violet spectrum on it also. And those are the colors of the spectrum. Why seven? Well, there are a lot of other re ways they could have come upon the seven as being intrinsic to this without having to know the seven color map theorem in our form. But it turns out that when you look at this object from various different perspectives, what you see are the letters of the Hebrew alphabet also letters of the Arabic alphabet, and in a related form, the double vortex, the Greek letters. If you see an A there, now you'll see an all. So what we have here, these two columns, are actual shadowgrams of this model. What I did is I took the model, pointed my TV camera at it, and brought it up on a TV screen, and made a tracing of it, and then I photo reduced it. So those are very accurate. And they're all there, and most of them are pretty good. Um, it's not very convincing, because they aren't necessarily in alphabetical order, and that's important. And we haven't done that yet. We need to do that on the computer. Although it is possible to peel off a third of the alphabet in alphabetical order by going around the figure. But let me tell you what, this, what all this amounts to, and why, why it should be the basis of of a religious tradition. What we have here is what I'm calling a geometric metaphor for spiritual transcendence. What the ancients seem to have done is they seem to have come up with a sequence of geometric objects that represents an embryonic process, represents the way a seed blossoms into a flower until it throws off a new seed. The idea is that these objects are parts of this embryonic process. And there's two parts to each object. There is a structural part, a framework, like the seed, like a shell, like the husk, and there is a an unfolding part, like the tree itself. You know, where did this come from? Where, how, did the, how did this all happen? Where, 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 how did they do it? What did it mean to them? If you want to make an alphabet, if you want to make a language, an, a, a technical alphabet, which maybe have later been adopted for phonetic use, that's going to be based on, on life, then there's one most important characteristic of a living system, of anything that's alive, and that is that it propagates. Oak trees grow from acorns, acorn, oak tree, acorn, oak tree forever, chicken and egg, chicken and egg forever. Life is an infinite recursive chain. Um, they, it, it extends forever. You could, you could start. <coughs> And, they, and a tree always grows from it, and it throws off another seed, and another tree grows, and another seed, and another tree grows. And all these trees are reaching for the, for the sun up on top, and they're all rooted in the earth, and this chain extends conceptually forever. 
As a matter of fact, the idea of the one God can be understood in this sense. If you want to know where God is, you can look into the tip of an acorn, conceptually, and down through the acorn into its oak tree, and down through the oak tree into its acorn, all the way back to creation. And that would be the right direction to look. And that's what's being modeled here. I want to read you a quotation from the introduction to the Zohar, which is one of the chief works in the Kabbalistic tradition. And this is the very beginning of it. This is the introduction. It's called The Lily. It says, the students of Rabbi Shimon were assembled together, sitting in silence, waiting for the master to begin his discourse. At length, Rabbi Shimon spoke and said, as a lily among the thorns. This lily, what does it symbolize? It symbolizes the congregation of Israel. The lily has 13 leaves surrounding it on all sides. What in the world does that mean? For this reason, the lily symbolizes the cup of blessing. As there are five words between the second and third Elohim mentioned in the book of Genesis, is God's name. One of these words is ur, meaning light. This light was treated and became enclosed as an embryo in the covenant. And entering into the lily as a principle of life made it fruitful. And this is what is called in scripture, fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself. And as this life principle entering into the covenant caused itself to become manifested in 42 kinds of second matter, so it has produced the 42 letter name of God. What has this got to do with anything? Well, let me identify this object for you. I told you it was like a menorah. It's also like many other things that have been mentioned in sacred literature. It's got a globular top to it. It's got a stem. It's sort of twisted up. It might be the Gordian knot cut by Alexander's sword. Or maybe it's the Grail cup cut by the sword of Longinus. I think it might very well be. It sits symmetrically inside this object. You see, every vortex could be on a square face, and every corner would be on a triangular face. And this object, Buckminster Fuller's vector equilibrium, has 12 spheres, 12 corners to it, and there's room in the middle for a center sphere. It's like a 13 petaled rose. And the lily, this is a field of lilies. After all, if you were to look at a calla lily, it looks sort of like a cow lily, another name for this object. It would be growing through this framework, and that's what I'm showing over here, that there is a framework, a structure, this 13 petaled rose, and through it grow these vortices, these calla lilies, these flowers, these flames. And between the center sphere and the sphere of sphere, there is this field of lilies, sort of like little wavicles, little photons between different orbital levels of an electron wave-particle duality. And so this object seems to fit the beginning descriptions. What are the 42? Turns out if you were to pack 12 little spheres around a center sphere, digging 13, you would make another layer. If you were to keep opening up the system layer by layer by layer, the next layer would have 42 spheres. It's the only geometric object that has that quality of one surrounded by 12, surrounded by 42. So it's clearly what is being discussed. And it's an embryonic process because it's showing how a seed unfurls into this whole system and then starts over again. Now I want to start from one other, one other place to give you an idea of how this fits together, because I want, to, I want to say some more about the language and what its meaning might be and how we're deriving it. And I think we're beginning to have a time problem anyway. Let's talk about sort of creation 